So I don't know if this is appropriate, or particularly appropriate for the Sausage Fest edition of Rational Security uh, that we find ourselves in, but I saw The Godfather for the first time last week. Yep, 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 that's right. And I got to say, um, it's a great movie. I mean, I don't know how I made it through 36 years without overwatching The Godfather, but it is not overrated. It's very long. I think I first saw really it at age overrated. 36, actually, now that you mention it, because that was a few years possible? ago, tripping for my wedding. I don't understand either, but it's true. It's phenomenal. How did you understand all the cultural references before you were 36? Like when somebody said to you, you're going to wake up with a horse's head in your bed tomorrow, what did you do? I have frequently uh, left the gun and taken the cannoli, and I, I didn't know that I was just acting out uh, a wonderful Godfather scene. I don't know. You just, I feel like there, you just, you, you kind of learn the the references by by osmosis. No, mostly Family Guy, Alan, for our generation. Let's be honest; it's <laughs> yeah, mostly, mostly Family mostly Guy family references. Guy, that's totally true. Well, you haven't seen Godfather two yet, though. No, but now I really, really want to. Just don't watch three. Is three not that good? good I, no, three is a disaster. No, not great. That's, that's 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 too bad. A lot of people think two is better than one. I am not one of those people, but two is two is a totally reputable movie. Ben, do you have a prefer? Are you a two versus one person? I am. Uh, if you, I mean, I think they are both brilliant. I will choose one over two if forced. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Have you seen the ultra mashup edition where they take <laughs> all of the like flashbacks and they edit them all into sequence and it becomes like one big long movie? Which is, I think the book worked. I think the, like the original book is actually incorporates a bunch of stuff that's in two and in one and like blends it together. And people have re-edited it into like a giant six hour movie. That does not seem like a good idea to me. The problem is with doing that is if you do it as one movie, you have this question of how Robert De Niro could grow up to look like Marlon Brando, much less to sound like Marlon Brando. It is a genuine question of casting issue, but, you know, you got to suspend disbelief somewhere, I guess. Bona Sera, what did I ever do to make you treat me so disrespectfully? You know, I'm just, I shouldn't have said anything because now I'm just... I'm because now Ben is going to do the entire freaking podcast in his Marlon Brando voice. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to Rational Security 2.0, aka Rational Security, the Podfather 2. Because oh. I, your host, Scott R. Anderson, am here with one of my regular co hosts, Alan Rosenstein. Hello. And in absence of our other regular co-host, Quinta Dresick, who is on vacation this week, we have brought in the original podfather himself, Benjamin Wittes. Benjamin, thank you for joining us here today. Uh, it's great to be here. I did my usual level of preparation for rational security, which is to say none. Um, and uh, so I'm excited about it. Well, this is like the Podfather 2, you know, because it's kind of like a flashback thing. We're going to flashback to Rational Security 1, where Ben would talk a bunch of stuff he didn't prepare without, for. Without We're going to pull that theme out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's perfect. It's perfect. Uh, well, I'm excited to have you guys here for what we are officially calling the Boys' Night Edition, uh, because it's just the boys here <laughs> getting ready yeah, to undo yeah. that top button, pop a yeah. couple of brewskis, slap on the game. It's Am I right, guys? Manspl- it's not the mansplaining edition. <laughs> I mean, we haven't gotten to it yet, but basically, basically. <laughs> the sausage I also thought about calling it Manalpalooza. I was going to say, it's like the worst. This is the worst, the worst mantle of all time. It is a nightmare <laughs> mantle. That is true. It's a night mantle. Uh, <laughs> I can't disagree. Honestly, night, night mantle sounds like a Showtime late night special that none of us should be watching. <laughs> yeah, the, of the worst The worst, the worst kind. <laughs> Featuring us. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> the uh, Well, we are, we are thrilled to have you here, even though our listeners may not be, because um, we've got a couple of big stories happening this week, many of which are very squarely up Ben's lane, and we're excited to get his views on as we hash through our three topics, which are the following. Topic one, sometimes the best defense is a new offensive. With apparent U.S. support, Ukraine is bringing the fight to Crimea and other Russian-held areas, and perhaps to the streets of Moscow itself, where well-known Russian nationalist Carr and Daughter were detonated this past week. What are the risks of this new strategy, and how far will or should the United States go in its support? Topic two. The enemy of my frenemy is my... Anemonemony? (laughs) Former former President Donald Trump's endorsement (laughs) appeared to hold significant, if not absolute, sway in several recent Republican primaries, where a number of election-denying candidates won. 
several with additional help from the DCCC, who supported them against more moderate opponents in hopes of having weaker competition in the general election. How might this strategy impact democratic norms and the rule of law? And topic three, special masters and the Don subtweet relationship. As more problematic facts regarding former President Donald Trump's possession of classified documents at his Mar-a-Lago estate come forward, his lawyers have put forward a novel argument seeking a special master to oversee what happens to the records recovered, one that hinges on Trump's ability to assert executive privilege against the executive branch. A pretty novel argument indeed. What should we make of this argument, and what does this case seem to mean for Trump's legacy moving forward? For our first topic, Alan, let me hand it over to you to get us started. So Ukraine is on the offensive. Uh, In the past week, the Ukrainian military has carried out a number of high-profile attacks on Russian targets, especially in Crimea, which Russia has been occupying illegally since 2014, and which holds enormous symbolic importance for the Ukrainians, but also for Russia, and in particular, Russian President Vladimir Putin. On Tuesday, uh, which is today as we're recording, Ukrainian President Zelensky vowed that by the end of the war, Ukrainian forces would retake Crimea from Russian control, saying, quote, the war began with Crimea and it will end with Crimea. In addition, over the weekend, a car bomb killed uh, Darya Dugin, the daughter of the Russian ultranationalist uh, Alexander Dugin, who has served as a sort of house philosopher, let's say, of uh, Russia's rising neo-imperialist kind of neo-fascist movement. We don't know who planted the bomb. The Russian government has blamed the Ukrainians. Uh, The Ukrainians have denied involvement. Uh, There are a lot of uh, other plausible perpetrators, uh, but it could be the Ukrainians. We just have no idea. Um, And just to add more fun to uh, Russia-Ukraine news, the Russian military continues its occupation of the uh, Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in southeastern Ukraine, where Ukrainian technicians continue to operate the plant at uh, Russian gunpoint, essentially, according to a recent New York Times article, uh, which further details worries about what a nuclear accident could mean for the region. So lots of lots of stuff happening there. Ben, let, let me start with you. What accounts, in your opinion, for Ukraine's recent military successes, if they are really successes rather than just tactical victories? And, and what does it say about Ukraine's evolving military strategy? So first of all, uh, I don't think we should call them yet successes. I think they are uh, successful individual strikes against supply lines and ammunition depots, including deep in Crimea. But I don't think you should call it a success until you see some strategic benefit from it. That is, the Ukrainians are clearly preparing an offensive in the south, And these strikes are designed to make sure that the frontline soldiers, particularly in the Kherson region, are not adequately supplied to repel the offensive when it comes. Everybody's sort of expecting it to happen sometime in September. But, you know, what the Ukrainians are doing clearly is trying to soften up uh, the front lines so that when they attack, they will uh, not be able to hold. Now, There are a number of reasons to be impressed with the strikes that they've conducted. Uh, The first is that they do seem to be hitting a very large number, uh, a large volume of Russian artillery and and command posts and uh, weapons depots. The second is that some of them are quite far back into Crimea. and the Russians are, you know, pulling stuff back, including the a lot of leadership. So it does seem to be effective. But, you know, until we see Ukrainians actually retaking territory, I think we should be careful about calling these victories or successes. Um, what accounts for them? Uh, the simple answer is the provision of high accuracy mid range uh, missiles, um, particularly by the United States. The Ukrainians have shown themselves quite capable of using whatever we give them effectively, but they're they have been limited by the actual weaponry provided. Uh now they are, you know, uh, much more unleashed and uh and they are uh inflicting some real pain. The one thing we have not seen the Ukrainians do, other than in the battle for Kiev, is actually retake territory. And 
Uh, that is one of the hardest things to do in land warfare is to move large numbers of troops over large amounts of square mileage. And, you know, if you look at a map, the Russians have taken quite a bit of territory in the east and in the south. And for this war to end in anything we can call a Ukrainian victory, some significant portion of that needs to be taken back. And that's, I think, the big open question about the Ukrainian forces. We know they are extremely powerful as a defensive force. Uh, we don't really know how good they are as an offensive force, and they they really haven't been on offense in in the eight years of this war. Scott, do you do you agree with Ben's let's call it measured evaluation of what we've seen in the last week? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I'm not a military expert, and I I won't pretend to be. But neither am my... I. Yeah. Well, <laughs> welcome to rational security, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We try and figure out things we don't know about here sometimes, so that's okay. You know, from the headlines, from the news, I, I had digested. It does seem like the Ukrainians are really focused on pushing back into the South in particular, you know, I think a lot of the talk of Crimea, targeting Crimea is aimed at more of a Southern offensive parts of the East, more recently lost territory, right? Like, and and the Ukrainians know that, like the international dynamics talk of like taking Crimea back, that's a tall order and is a very different conflict given that frankly, like most of the international community wrote off any sort of military struggle over Crimea in 2014. Uh, and frankly, that's going to be a little bit of a different calculus, I think. Probably this all comes with a little bit of heartache and heartburn, I think, for the Biden administration and probably for European allies as well, figuring out, well, what is does this do to the risk of escalation? But, you know, this is still pretty much, with, a lot of it within bounds of what there's already been agreed the United States would support, which is, you know, military operations on Ukrainian territory. Ukrainians do do some things outside of Ukrainian territory, um, particularly tar targeting supply lines, some other strategic action. But, you know, they also, uh, most of those are done with things, at least publicly, they say that's not done with U.S.-backed weapons. The United States keeps its arm's length of those things to limit that escalation risk. And that's still the public line. There's some discussion, there's been some news reporting this week, that there might be certain types of more secretive assistance, primarily of a kind of materiel type, uh, but it, it supposedly could be intelligence sharing and other perhaps tar targeting assistance as well that might be communicated, but that's being done through co covert channels to keep it covert, um, because that's part of the message that the United States and its allies do not want to send to Russia about trying to escalate this. The fact they're keeping it covert while they're allowing other sorts of assistance to very openly move forward just shows the kind of careful line they're trying to walk here. And I think this remains consistent with that policy. Um, you know, they were always going to have to hit back, particularly after the Russians abandoned their kind of, pardon the term, because kind of loaded in this context, but a blitzkrieg sort of offense moved straight on Kiev, try and hit, seize the capital, decapitate the leadership. Once it became clear that wasn't there, this was going to become a slow grinding war of attrition, essentially. Uh, and to do that, you can't let one side, um, you know, essentially keep its supply lines, everything behind it. You've got to weaken it, make it harder for them to hold land, make it more painful for them. And that's something the Ukrainians can do, even if they might not be as well positioned to take territory back in a more conventional military uh, kind of head-to-head -head conflict. Yeah. So I want to follow up on the point, Scott, that you made about escalation, because I think on the one hand, you're, you're right that the Ukrainians are clearly very aware of this and they're trying to limit escalation. On the other hand, though, and maybe here I'm reading too much into the statement that Zelensky you know, just made about retaking Crimea. You know, I, I, like I'm sure the rest of us, am a, on, on the Ukrainian side. And so it's always tempting to say that you know, any Ukrainian victory is a good one. But it does strike me that you know, if the goal of, for the Ukrainians really is the retaking of Crimea, it makes it very hard to see how you could have anything like a negotiated settlement if that's the Ukrainian goal. It does seem that for Putin not only to not succeed in toppling the government of, of Ukraine and quote unquote denazifying it, as you know, he started the campaign trying to do, but to lose Crimea, which is maybe the most popular thing he's done in his entire presidency and that he clearly cares enormously about, seems like a recipe for Russian escalation and only one side has nuclear weapons. In this conflict, so you know, should should we sh should we then say that well, Zelensky understands that, and therefore his statements about Crimea are just posturing, or they're trying to set a high negotiating baseline with which he can walk back from? Either way, the, the the question seems to me that you know, for every Ukrainian tactical victory, which I applaud, it does seem that 
it might make the ultimate resolution of this that much more complicated. So I'm not sure why you feel that way about uh, this particular issue relative to all the other humiliations that the Ukrainians have inflicted on the Russians in this conflict. The Russians said they were going to take Kiev in 72 hours. They won't have done it within 72 weeks. Uh, they uh, were going to uh, decapitate the Zelensky government, which seems more stable at this point than Putin's government. I don't think there is any short-term scenario in which the Ukrainians retake Crimea. This front is moving in meters per week, not in in any dramatic sweeps right now. The immediate Ukrainian objective seems to be retaking the city of Kherson. I think you'd have to imagine a major Russian front collapse for the uh, Ukrainians to have any plausible uh, possibility of retaking Crimea. I think the reason they're hitting Crimea the way they are is because uh, the Black Sea Fleet is based there because it has direct supply routes over the Kersh Bridge to Russia, and because they can fuck up a lot of people's vacations in a way that actually creates domestic friction at home in Russia. But I don't, I, I haven't seen any. I mean, Zelensky, when he says that, is reflecting the fact that the Ukrainians conceptually do not accept the Russian annexation of Crimea. And but I don't see any prospect of a short term Ukrainian recapturing of Crimea. Yeah, I, I think Zelensky's comments can be boiled down to two as strategic aspects here. There's two things that saying this does, even though I agree with Ben, I don't think there's any short term or medium term prospect of really making it a reality. One, it puts in the minds of Russians, maybe Putin himself, probably more importantly, other Russians, that this conflict is coming at a real loss. That symbolic victory that's a popular run of Crimea, while it may not be lost in terms of taking territory back, it is certainly being endangered, threatened, and devalued by the fact that it is now the site of a theater of open conflict. You know, we saw really striking footage of Russian tourists having to flee uh, bombs nearby in the background, right? Uh, that the Ministry of Defense or Foreign Affairs, I can't remember, for the U Ukraine actually publicized on Twitter, which I actually want to get back to in a second because I actually think there's a problem with that. But uh, that's part of it is signaling about the fact that, look, you really stand stuff to lose here, Russia. This isn't just about Ukrainian territory, uh, or at least what you recognize as Ukrainian territory. This is also about property that you had stable control of and the international community let you get away with that we are now going to put back in the game, even if the odds are slim. The second part of it is also making clear that this is a part of the military objective opens up the game to doing a lot more military activity there, right? It's no longer quite as escalatory to make the point that this is somehow like behind Russian lines. Like, you know, the Ukrainians have done or appeared to have done certain things behind, you know, the Russian border, but a lot more constrained than they've been the rest of Ukraine. I think this is signaling that that line is actually really going back to the Russian border now, and they're trying to bring Crimea in play. Again, that might not help seize it. It makes it a lot easier to target and like visually less complicated to target Russian supply lines in Crimea, other sorts of behind the front line support. And it's making clear that it's in play and it's kind of legitimizing those sorts of military targets. I don't think if it legally makes that big a difference. I don't think it does, but it's more about the public framing of it. What I will say, I think there is actually a real danger though in some of the stuff Ukraine's been doing. And it's been true throughout. And I'll say it in very frank terms. I hope friends of Ukraine, and I consider myself a friend of Ukraine in, in most, if not all regards, but I think they need to have a real conversation with that this, is that Ukraine is getting close to having a law of war problem. You know, when you are advertising through your official agencies that you are taking military strikes to terrorize a civilian population, even if it's a detestable civilian population, that is a law of war violation. Uh, and it's a real problem. Now, if, if you didn't weren't actually doing it for that purpose, and I think there are good reasons to think they weren't, that's one thing. But if you are doing it for that purpose, that's a real, real problem, and you shouldn't be. And the fact that the Russians are doing such worse things, I think, doesn't get to the fact that you are you shouldn't sink to those lows yourself. I think this potential of Ukrainian involvement in the Dugan killing, which I think is very much an open question, I don't think we know what happened there, but if there were Ukrainian involvement in that, that would be a real line to cross. That would be a real problem, because this is somebody who is not even 
as detestable as they are, as influential they may be in the public narrative justifying this conflict, was clearly not in any sort of chain of command or in any way a legitimate military target of the Russians. So that's the gentleman whose car it's owned. Of course, they ended up killing whoever did this, his daughter, deliberately or not. Also an ideologue in her own right, also a public figure in her own right, but you know, not even the same level of influence uh, with the kind of elites of Russia as her father. That would be a real problem. You know, I, I still will only hope Ukrainians were not involved in that, and that is Russian spin on it in a variety of ways. And we'll have to wait to see what information comes forward. But if there's a chance the Ukrainians were, that could be a real problem for an international community that's rallied against Russia in recent years in significant part prior to Ukraine over Russia's targeted killing of political enemies in other countries. So, again, I think that's the real both a, there's an escalation risk there, but more importantly for Ukraine, there's a weakening of its international support risk that I'm hoping they're they're not rolling the dice on. Yeah, so I, a couple things. First of all, in Crimea, I have actually seen no evidence that those strikes were done to terrorize a civilian population. I've seen evidence that there were big explosions in a zone that, you know, is the seat of the Black Sea Fleet where there are major ammunition depots and that civilians on a beach were were horrified. And I, I, I conclude from that that civilians probably shouldn't vacation in war zones. But I agree with you, Scott, if they probably shouldn't be publicizing, triumphantly publicizing videos of civilians being terrorized if they are not, in fact, seeking to do it, it sends the wrong message. As to Dugan, I very much agree that if there is evidence of Ukrainian involvement in her killing, she is not a combatant. Uh, she is a loathsome individual. Her father is also not a combatant. He is a loathsome individual, and they shouldn't be targeting them. I will also just say there is no real evidence of Ukrainian involvement in this at this stage. And we should remember that among the many uh, organized crime groups in Russia who occasionally kill people, there is the small matter that Vladimir Putin has been known to blow up apartment buildings to justify war uh, against the Chechens. There's as much reason to believe he killed his own people to martyr them for the cause as there is to believe the Ukrainians did it. Well, I think that's all the time we can spend on this topic, but let's go from the war of attrition in Ukraine and Crimea to a war of attrition here at home. Uh, and that is, of course, the political war of attrition uh, between the parties here in American domestic <laughs> politics. Because it has been a painful and little crazy couple of weeks here uh, where we've seen some people uh, perhaps uh, resort to some things that have proven a bit controversial. They've been a tritting. They've been a tritting. People have been a tritting and a trotting uh, here on the domestic <laughs> front in ways that are upsetting, to say the least, uh, for many. We have, on the one hand, seen a number of Republican primaries really over the last several weeks. So I think the, the biggest wave of them is now over. I think there are still a few yet to take place where we have seen a pretty solid showing um, by Trump endorsements, but by no means a sort of a wholehearted a wave of reactions. We've seen several anti-Trump candidates kind of withstand sharp challenges. Um, we also know a lot of that we've seen the, the kind of Trump camp try and juke its numbers a little bit by essentially going and endorsing a lot of candidates in not very competitive races, sometimes without them even knowing. There are several reports that are kind of interesting about Republican nominees in various races suddenly finding out on, on Truth Social uh, or via email that they were endorsed by Donald Trump without having any interactions with him or his people before that. But then we also were seeing this really interesting strategy that's proven really controversial on the part of the DCCC, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, which supports, of course, Democratic candidates for the House of Representatives. And we have seen them in a number of places put money behind Trump-backed candidates or Trump-associated candidates in apparent hopes, one can only assume, uh, that they will win the Republican primaries and therefore be weaker competition in the general election to come in November. And this 
may have played some role. It's hard to know for the exact margins, but is believed by some to have played some role in a number of defeats of relatively moderate Republicans, some of whom are even among those Republicans who voted to impeach Donald Trump. Uh, Peter Mayer of, uh, in Michigan being probably the leading, most high profile example. Um, somebody who's been very critical of Trump uh, and generally supportive of a lot of accountability efforts against him who lost his primary and now will no longer be in office come January. Alan, let me turn to you first. What should we be making about how, what these primaries tell us about the role of the big lie, the role of democratic norms, and, and what this coming election may mean for them? And how does this DCCC strategy kind of fit into that, rightly or wrongly, from your perspective? Sure. But f f first, just to comment on your observation that some of these candidates have been endorsed by Trump without realizing it because they find out on social media. It's actually exactly how I became a Lawfare senior editor. One day I was just looking at Twitter and suddenly I saw a tweet from Ben Wittes announcing that I was a senior editor. So it was a lovely surprise. You know, it's not it's not a bad way to be uh, to be elevated. And you repaid me by voting for my impeachment. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. And I do it again. Um, and look, I definitely want to talk about the DCCC endorsement. I've been ranting about it to everyone who will listen, as Scott knows, because I've been ranting about it to him for the last three weeks. You know, at the end of the day, it is important to put all that in perspective. The people who are responsible for nominating anti-democratic crazy people are the Republican primary voters and the Republican Party. There's just no way around that. That is obviously the leading motivator. It's not because Democrats somehow convinced a bunch of moderate Republicans to vote for extremists. It's because the Republican Party and the Republican base is unfortunately not committed to small d democracy. This is something we've known for a long time. But with every you know, with every primary election, with every election cycle, where not only do we not see a repudiation of Trumpism in the party, but we see, frankly, almost its acceleration. You know, Georgia might be a, a rare place where the, the anti-Trump forces have done okay, but frankly, in most other primaries, we've seen that the Trump endorsement matters, paying fealty to the big lie matters. All of that is what the base wants. You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure there's anything much deeper to say than that one of our two major parties is just not committed, frankly, anymore to small d democratic norms. And it's, 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 it's terrifying, frankly. Um, and it just shows that even if Trump goes away, Trumpism will, will remain, right, either in the form of these extremist Republican candidates or in the form of the most popular Republican politicians. You know, I'm thinking, obviously, of Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, um, who is, you know, Trumpist in everything but the incompetence. And, and I think it's, 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 it's really quite, quite scary. Now, having said that, let me now rant a little bit about the DCCC. You know, I, I, I think that it's not only morally abhorrent, it's also just stupid. You know, the, the, the idea that you can game your way into picking the candidate that you want just doesn't work very well in a highly polarized country where lots of elections ultimately come down to uh, coin tosses. Uh, frankly, even in districts that you know, quote unquote, are leaning blue, um, given how much we know about the inaccuracy of of polling and in the fact that this is just frankly uh, still a pro-Republican political environment. You know, Democrats were delighted when Donald Trump got the Republican nomination back in 2016 because they thought that he would be unelectable in the general election. And, you know, we all know what happened there. So you know, not only as a moral matter is it, I think, just disgusting for Democrats, and obviously not all Democrats, um, right? The DCCC has, to Democrats' credit, gotten a lot of criticism from fellow Democrats, and I think they'll hopefully knock it off because of that. But not only is it morally abhorrent to go on and on and on about how Trump and Trump-aligned candidates are the greatest threat to American democracy, uh, which is true, and I completely agree with, and then to turn around and to make everyone so cynical by supporting those candidates. Not only is it morally a disaster, it's not even, it doesn't even make sense uh, as a matter of real politique. And, and so I, I, it's just, it's the worst of, it, it's just, it's just, it's why everyone hates politicians and it's why everyone hates politics. And I just cannot believe that they would make this, this, this kind of error. Um, again, in the grand scheme of things, this is 5%, right, of, you know, 10%, 7%, you know, some, some low amount of why the Republican primary is, being if not dominated than generally being won by these Trumpist figures. But why the Democrats would want to go anywhere near this is just totally beyond me. 
So I want to make a brief effort to kind of defend what the DCCC is doing, maybe explain it a little bit, I think, although I ultimately kind of come down where you are on it, Alan. But then I also want to pivot to a different sort of critique about what's happening. Uh, that takes a little different view of at least I, I, my read of Republican politics than yours. On, on the first DCCC front, I think it's no so that this is the DCCC doing this, right? Because they are the ones responsible for House elections. And the House as an institution is like more of a zero-sum game than other parts of government, particularly the Senate in a way. Because the House majority, the House leadership drives the legislative agenda in a way that's just not even true of the majority leadership in the Senate. That also plays a really strong hand in driving the substantive agenda, right? But there's more compromise, there's more leverage countering them. The majority leadership in the House really, really drives the boat in terms of what you can get done. And for that reason, it becomes much more of a zero-sum game. It really matters whether even if you've got a margin of just one or two members of Congress being having that majority to be able to set those priorities. And so I get why and frankly, that this actually isn't the first time this has been the case in the last few years. You see the DCCC doing things that a lot of people, other people, even other like political operatives, Democratic Party, are like, whoa, this seems like a little bit of a stretch makes them nervous. That's because the DCCC's institutional focus is on the House. And, and I think that might explain some of why they're willing to take this extra step that we're not really seeing, at least to my knowledge, other major you know, Democratic campaign operations undertake. That said, I still think, I agree, it's generally a problem, not just for backing these candidates, uh, who I actually think are often weaker candidates, but but precisely because from a national perspective, you really, I think, as a country and as a, as a if we are going to be committed to small d democratic norms, you need to support the parts of the Republican Party that do still believe in those things, of whom I believe there's a substantial portion. Uh, and I honestly am one of those few people who believes like a lot of people who are Republican voters and re- vote for Republican candidates don't always love a lot of this Trumpy driven stuff and would be open to more moderate candidates, might even prefer them if push came to shove, but they're not the most activist, the loudest, the best funded parts of the party right now. The most activist part of the party, that is a big chunk of that are people who buy into uh, former President Trump's you know, worldview uh, or certain perspectives and back him. And, and that's kind of the challenge right now is how do you empower those other parts of the party that to speak more loudly and give people the personal courage to stay in the fight and keep arguing against that narrative of the big lie that we hear coming from one part of the Republican Party inside the Republican Party in actual elections, contesting these elections. You know, as we've talked about before on this podcast, that's why I think what Representative Cheney is doing is so brave because she did stand in the primary. She did not retire or withdraw uh, and stood and contested and fought it out to the end and may yet fight it out in presidential election uh, in the next presidential election on the Republican ticket. And and right now, I kind of hope that she does. But we need to have more of those people in the Republican Party making those arguments. And that, to me, is the real you know, downside here. Now, balance that out with the DCCC, balance that out with the fact that Democrats, like a lot of Democrats, want to advance a Democratic agenda independent of, you know, preserving Democratic norms and practices, uh, or at least in addition to, and, and, and you get the calculus, you can get the decision that comes out the other way. Um, but I do find it troubling. And in the end, I, I do query whether this isn't a moment where we really want to support those pro-democratic forces, the alliance of all democratic forces, to borrow a phrase from somebody I know, that that should carry through to these sorts of political decisions. Um, you know, it's it's a difficult question. I do think we have to see what the rest of the Democratic Party does and the rest of kind of like the partisan elites, the funders, the other people. I think you're going to see a lot of people who are traditional, frankly, Democratic funders go support, give a lot of money to Liz Cheney. And I think you're going to see a lot of movement towards other parts of what would generally be considered a more Democratic partisan apparatus, support those other people. And I think those are good steps and, you know, frankly, well-founded. But so I don't think this is necessarily the dominant trend, but I do agree it's alarming here and, and it's something we should be wary of. Yeah, just a couple things on this. As the person who coined the phrase "the coalition of all democratic forces," that's I what really, the coalition of all democratic forces. I I really do not uh, think the D trip should be in the business of taking out the Peter Myers of the world, and I don't know that I believe that these ads that they ran, the money they pumped into these races, was dispositive in any particular way. But I agree with both of you that it's uh, gross and they shouldn't be doing it. I will say that the analogy here is to playing Russian roulette. You know, in normal in normal roulette, you have a relatively small chance at a high payout, right? You spin the wheel. If it lands on your number, you get a lot of money. But chances are it's not going to land on your number. 
but the costs of failure are low, which is to say you lose your bet, you don't lose much more. Russian roulette is the opposite. You have a very high chance of winning, which is to say five of six chances to get a a, a, a good, really good payout. But if you lose, you're dead. And that's what the D-trip is playing here. They have a pretty high chance of uh, actually taking Meyer's seat now. But if they fail, they've elected, they've replaced a reasonable, uh, sane Republican who believes in democracy with an election denier type of precisely the type that is threatening to kill American democracy. And so the, the real question here is, how do you feel about the one of our political parties that is still sane and that is still democratic in character playing Russian roulette with the other and I think it's a it's a terrible idea. And and just to be clear, I, I agree with everything Ben said. But just to be clear, it's not just this that is a kind of Russian roulette or let's call it high high stakes gambling, right? It it's the unwillingness of the Democratic Party. And here I'm referring both to President Biden, but also to in particular House Democrats, but also I guess to to those Senate Democrats who aren't willing to uh, modify or eliminate the filibuster to prioritize the targeted democracy reforms that we desperately, desperately need to safeguard our basic democratic process, right? So, you know, we very predictably are going to have more Trumpy, not just national figures, which is bad, but whatever, but potentially even more dangerously Trumpy state officials in places, let's say, like Arizona or places potentially like Pennsylvania, swing states where the role of local officials in ensuring that the 2024 election and the 2026 and 28 elections are free and fair, right? Now, obviously, the the White House or the Democrats in Congress can't directly affect who the Republicans choose to be their politicians, but uh, they could have expended a lot of their political capital at the beginning of the Biden administration on, for example, passing laws that would ensure that you know, state governments were limited in what sort of election interference they could do with, right? And instead, you had the Biden administration wait several years to start pushing for you know, democracy reform. And by contrast, in the House, you had, although they started with HR1, uh, which was this giant package of every possible election-related reform that Democrats had wanted for years and years, was actually not responsive to the specific anti-democratic threat. And then, of course, you know, insert the usual complaints about Manchin and Cinema and uh, other you know, moderate Democratic senators who uh, think that the filibuster is more important than the health of American democracy. I, ju I just think there's, a, again, a lack of seriousness uh, among a lot of the Democrats uh, about um, identifying the most important problem to American democracy and then taking those targeted steps and expending the political capital to do what you can to allow the great American democratic experiment to keep on rolling. And it's just, it's been the, for me, the biggest disappointment, frankly, of, of democratic rule of the last two years. So Alan, but what is the legislative package you're think is missing here, right? Cause we have HR one, which, you know, was criticized by people on the right, including like, you know, non-Trump people, like a lot of mainstream Republicans is saying like, this is a, a, a package that blends things that are, seem to be responsive to the last few years with a lot of other longstanding democratic agendas around elections, like easing access to voting, you know, fighting redistricting, things like that, that, that have a different partisan kind of gloss for, for a lot of Republicans, right? Like, you know, that, that bill struggled to get much Republican support at all, even though there are parts of it that could be, and in some cases have been kind of broken off and, and, and attempt to move forward separately, you know, whereas in the other cases you've seen, you know, electoral count act reform and then the associated bill with the electoral count act reform that we have bipartisan kind of coalition backing in the Senate that's doing things like supporting cybersecurity funding for elections, doing a lot of like pretty pragmatic measures to like, you know, address low hanging fruit around like election fraud issues, basically. And some of those bigger, you know, the bigger outlier cases and issues that we're encountering doesn't tackle redistricting, doesn't tackle a lot of those other issues that are 
little more just politically contentious and have been for a very long time. Uh, you know, I tend to agree that they're a problem there, a hundred percent. That's that's my viewpoint. But I also am not sure that they had a political path any better than HR one did. And in, in that case, like you know, insofar as the Biden administration, Democrats in Congress have been holding some of these packages and maybe trying not to get them politically charged, make the political issues to avoid losing Republican votes by politicizing it, which is what they've done with, you know, that's the path they've taken with ECA reform that so far seems to be moving along effectively. Like that doesn't strike me as an entirely bad pitch. There's more I wish they would have done in some regards. I've written pieces about that, but, you know, it, it's still strategically, it doesn't strike me as a, as a total, you know, nonsense move. So, so I, I should I should clarify in case I, I wasn't clear. I'm I'm criticizing HR one for being a giant grab bag of stuff that even if you agree with right campaign finance reform, maybe we should have campaign finance reform, right? But like campaign finance reform is not the key to saving American democracy. Neither is probably gerrymandering reform, though gerrymandering is bad. Honestly, it's not even clear that things like voter ID is the big threat to American democracy. It's definitely particularly obnoxious, but there's you know good evidence that these voter IDs laws and general voter restrictions don't actually help either party, right? The clear, I think, threat to American democracy right now and for 2024 is the ability of state officials and potentially state legislatures to muck around and overturn the the votes. And so, you know, what I would have loved to see was a big push to pass federal legislation that would address that particular issue, right? Now, maybe the response to that, and maybe this is what you were saying, Scott, was, well, but if they had done that, it would have politicized it. And in fact, they needed to wait a while and work behind the scenes because that's what gave us ERA reform, which we hopefully will pass. And, may- and maybe that's right, right? I'm totally open to the fact that there's, you know, I'm not a politician. I'm not a legislative strategist. Maybe there's some real three-dimensional chess happening behind the scenes, right? And they're working on this. Um, it does not seem to me to be the case. I'm I'm just trying to make the kind of common sense point that, you know, by definition, American democracy, the the state of American democracy is by definition always the most important issue in American politics because it is the thing that makes American politics and its ability to deal with any other issue possible. And it just bums me out that we have not seen the sort of focus on that that I would have thought given the real threat that Democrats keep talking about because it's true. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say I'm not sure the Delta is that big about what we. I I, I want. I think it's worth waiting to the end to see what this Congress actually produces because I think there are a few things floating. Uh, I think we've had this debate before that might actually address again some of the most important lowest hanging fruit with bipartisan support, which makes them a lot more durable, which is actually very important in this regard as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic about certain aspects of that. Doesn't mean there aren't still huge problems out there. I agree with. Um, the only other point I want to flag here uh, regarding this before we move out of this topic is, you know, the one other reason why I think some of what is happening with the DTTT strategy and the reason why it's poorly charmed is bef- because in my mind, a lot of these primaries are actually still kind of a sign of weakness in Trump's camp in terms of his hold on the GOP. You know, the fact that they are trying to, again, pump their stats up by doing these late endorsements is not a sign of confidence. Uh, And it's kind of a new move for Trump's camp, not entirely new, but the scale at which they seem to be doing it now. And that combined with like kind of the open problems, a lot of the back candidates, whether it's, you know, Herschel Walker uh, or or other folks and other Mastriano, like all these folks are are causing problems that really clearly seem like they're likely to cost um, Republicans the Senate at this point, um, potentially other statewide elections. Like this is a moment of weakness, I think, as whole. Like I don't think this is a a success story for Trump's folks. I don't think Trump's folks are really welcoming it that way or others in the Republican Party are, despite some of the conventional to be expected talking points. So in my mind, that's even more reason why if, if there's signs of that grip on the party weakening, you need to support and reinforce other voices. And hopefully that's the avenue I think a lot of folks will be looking to take moving forward, DCCC's latest strategy notwithstanding. All right. Let's go from Trump's hold in the Republican Party to Trump's hold on classified and otherwise sensitive government documents. Uh, so Trump not surprising at all, is not taking the FBI search of uh, his residence at Mar-a-Lago well. Uh, Just as a reminder, several weeks ago, the FBI executed a search warrant at Mar-a-Lago for uh, classified and other sensitive government documents that uh, Trump had retained beyond when he was president, which is when he was allowed to keep these documents. Um, And the search warrant alleged uh, violations of a number of of important statutes, including the uh, Espionage Act. Uh, In a Monday filing, Trump's team asked 
uh, a Florida court to appoint what is called a special master to review the documents that DOJ seized. A special master is a uh, individual appointed by the court to assist it in uh, certain investigations. This happens frequently in very complicated civil matters where the court needs to render a decision and that decision requires a huge amount of um, empirical information. I mean, it also, uh, special masters are also sometimes appointed uh, where, for example, the government is um, accused of civil rights violations and uh, you need someone sort of outside the government to do investigating of, of the government. To my knowledge, and I'm curious what you all think, uh, special masters are not a thing that are used in uh, criminal investigations. The Trump team uh, is nevertheless uh, asking for one. And this is despite the fact that there is already a filter team uh, that DOJ is using, uh, basically a separate set of investigators that are going through all the information that was collected at Mar-a-Lago to make sure that no attorney-client or otherwise privileged information is passed on to the main investigative team. There's also, uh, outside the legal proceedings, some interesting reporting coming out uh, of the New York Times and other outlets about Trump's retention of documents. And this shows just how much classified information Trump had taken, uh, just how much back and forth there was between the National Archives and the Trump team, you know, saying, you have to give us this information back. Hey, you might have more information. This is a big problem. So let me start, uh, let me start with you, Scott. Is there any merit to the complaints, uh, whether about the special master or about the kind of broader Fourth Amendment issues that Trump is also complaining about? Is there anything to what Trump is saying, or is this just incompetent Trump legal bluster? of the sort we've seen for many years. I don't tend to think there's much to uh, much of this. No. Um, uh, look, I mean, they, they have at various times described uh, the search warrant as like all encompassingly broad, although for various reasons we've talked about on our podcast and our writing, that's not really true. Like it's not that different from a lot of search warrants, what, particularly particularly an offense like this, where you don't hundred percent know exactly what you're looking for. You're looking for classified materials and presidential records, you know, it doesn't get much more precise than that in this particular case, but you know they've oscillated between arguments that 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 they've ex then they've exceeded the scope of a very specific search warrant. Um, all these kind of inconsistent arguments coming from Trump's camp, Trump supporters that that often don't rival each other. The idea that they didn't know it was classified document that he had already declassified these documents, and none of it's backed up by much many of the facts that we see coming forward. We see this letter from NARA, this exchange that was very clearly leaked by Trump's camp because it was done to you know a Trump friendly reporter and websites that's beginning. Lots of information about this in text form. It was just this. It was just the side that was sent to Trump's camp. It wasn't the rest of uh, the government's exchange. One of the letters from Trump to the government, and it's this assertion that it's this le private previous letter that makes no acknowledgement that any of this stuff had been declassified. No assertion of that. Um, it's not, apparently, wasn't even an argument that Trump's camp had been making at the time. Even though now it's become a core part of their defense, although for reasons I wrote about last week, like kind of a nonsense part. And then you have the special master request about this idea that they're supposed to be filtering out what they say is kind of privileged executive communications, uh, which is essentially seems to be an assertion of executive privilege against the executive branch, which is, you know, the FBI. It's a core part of the executive branch. It is really like the utmost nonsense opinion. Former presidents, uh, we did see the Supreme Court suggest, at least Justice Kavanaugh and a few others suggested they people do think former presidents have some right to assert executive privilege, but it's for the to, to avoid disclosure to Congress or to third parties, not to within the executive branch that's supposed to have access to all these government records. The one part of this, I don't think Trump's complaint has merit, but there might be reasons that even the FBI might be okay with doing something like a special master, for instance, is that there very well might be, you know, attorney client privileged information mixed up in this documents, right? Like these are a bunch of documents they appear to have taken from Trump's property, from his office. It included a few passports that they quickly handed back. And the FBI used this kind of scrub team, a clean team to collect this stuff and presumably filter out that sort of privileged information. Those are real privileges private individuals like Donald Trump have, not this fantasy executive privilege he's asserting. And, you know, usually the FBI search, like that's pretty standard procedure. That kind of filtering out is supposed to be effective. But if they're really worried about optics here, if they're really concerned about the allegations that they were doing something inappropriate, then maybe sign off on the special master. Just argue about what the special master is supposed to be doing. Make clear, we don't buy this executive privilege. There's no reason to withhold that. But if there's attorney-client privilege things in here or spousal privilege or something else um, that might be relevant, yeah, go ahead and filter that out, special master. That's fine. You know, that's the sort of thing that I think the FBI would almost categorically oppose in every other case as a big waste of time. But in a high-profile case like this, like maybe it's worth being extra, extra, extra safe and giving in to 
those livers of demands to undermine in advance those arguments that will come later. The worst thing that happens then for the FBI and the Justice Department is that if they're accidentally, their filter did not prove effective and something that was privileged did come through, they have an extra layer of protection to keep it from harming their eventual case. So, you know, maybe there's some argument as to why the FBI would even be willing to go along with this, but that doesn't mean it's merited. It just means that there's like some element of logic underneath it. And it's not going to get at what Trump's really getting at here. That part really relies on pretty nonsense arguments, in my view. Yeah, just to go back briefly, Alan, to your question about whether special masters have any role in criminal proceedings, the answer is they sometimes do play the role that Scott is describing here as a kind of filter layer on searches. And uh, an example of that is in the Michael Cohen case uh, in a prior Trump instance, uh, uh, there were questions about whether the FBI had seized material that might be privileged. So the judge in the case, it's usually a former judge appoints, you know, appoints a kind of former judge as special master. The important point is that it is done uh, for the uh, service of the court, uh, not as a a kind of civil liberties instrument for a potential uh, search subject. Um, And, you know, here I don't see any reason to believe that the filter team was inadequate. Uh, I don't think Trump has pointed to any such evidence. And I think this looks like a lot. They're just kind of throwing up a lot of smoke. If the judge needs help, I have no objection to having a special master uh, provide that help. That, that, no, that's that's really helpful, uh, the, the point that special masters are for the court, they're not for the defendant. I, am I right, though, that this is not the case where the judge would probably need help? I mean, they didn't take that many boxes. I mean, obviously, they, they took a bunch of boxes, but this is not the sort of civil case where you have millions and millions of pieces of data that the special master goes through. It's like a fairly contained universe of stuff. And the issue here seems to be that it's controversial, but you don't need a special master to help you just because it's controversial, right? I mean, that's normally why you have an Article Three judge. <laughs> um, and <laughs> Cue the song about how the judge is smarter than you and all that. Yeah, exactly. That stuff. Um, but I, I, I don't think... Look, the the argument of, for a special master here really boils down to hair on fire. The FBI raided Mar-a-Lago. Blah, 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 blah. It's not fair. It's witch hunt. And so we need a special master. Uh, Fourth Amendment. And, I, you know, I, I think we can all be appropriately cynical about that argument. Um, there are uh, complicated filtering questions whenever you do something like this and privileges may be involved, you know, so it is not a crazy thing to think that the court might sift through some of this stuff. That said, I don't see any reason not to leave that to the court to decide. So, Ben, while I have you, uh, and, and this is fun because in, in our recent podcast, it's, it's been uh, you interviewing the rest of us. So now I can interview you and ask you the unfair question that you like to ask me. So, Ben, it's prediction time. What are the next steps for this investigation? And most importantly, what do you think is going on in Merrick Garland's head about the Mar-a-Lago search? So I, I guess I think that the likelihood that this investigation goes into some kind of, uh, at least from the public's point of view, deep freeze is pretty high. Uh, and the reason is that while the so-called window around a presidential election doesn't apply to this case or around any federal election doesn't apply to this case because uh, Trump is not on any ballot, I think it it sort of spiritually applies and the likelihood that you would have major overt steps in a criminal probe against Trump in the two months before an election is is pretty minimal. And so I think the likeliest scenario is that we go from people complaining that Merrick Garland is is moving too slowly to people complaining that he's a jackbooted uh, Gehring disciple to people complaining that he's moving too slowly within, you know, a small number of months in which it would have been very predictable that very little has happened. The other factor that I think is probably or maybe at play here is that 
while there was some kind of exigency associated with the nature of these materials to recover them, there is no exigency to bring whatever case you're going to bring. And, you know, given that Trump's conduct is clearly at issue in the January 6th case as well, you might have a instinct at the Justice Department to wait on the resolution of this until you figure out how you're going to deal with him in the January 6th context. And so you may have some sort of deferred, you get all the investigative steps done, but then you defer resolution of it, at least public resolution, until you kind of know, is this is this the shot you're taking or is this part of a larger indictment that's also about trying to stop the peaceful transmission of power? Is it like Donald Trump tried to stop the peaceful transition of power and when he failed, he stole a bunch of classified documents? Or is it, hey, he took a bunch of documents and refused to you know, give them back and hoarded uh, them at Mar-a-Lago? Those are very different cases. In, in um, As to what's going on in Merrick Garland's head, I, I think the uh, I sort of don't purport to know the answer to that question, obviously, but Look, Garland has done exactly what those of us who supported his nomination and urged his nomination would have predicted he's done, which is he's moved deliberatively and carefully and he's thought through everything, you know, a hundred times, but he's also acted decisively and uh, moved the ball forward in a fairly consistent fashion. And so I, you know, I understand that the opaqueness of Merrick Garland's uh, mode of operation frustrates people, but this is who he is. And, you know, you can complain about the speed at which he raids Mar-a-Lago, but you will not, when he does it, you're not going to find that a judge is going to question it because they, the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. So I, I, I don't know what he's thinking, but I'm sure he's thinking about it in his uh, in his own very careful fashion that will take longer than people want and will be extremely thorough and defensible when he does whatever he's going to do. I couldn't agree with anything uh, Ben said anymore, um, but I do want to put a different gloss on it, something I think has really been driven home in the last few days with some of the information that's come out, both in some of President Trump's own briefing and to some extent the NARA letter uh, that came out, but also in media reports. And that is that this case, in my view, I think presents the single greatest legal threat to Donald Trump. Setting aside, at least from the federal government, setting aside Fulton, Georgia, right? Like where I think actually there's a similar kind of smoking gun incident in regards to that recorded phone call of Trump, in which Trump was involved. But if you are going to go after the president, you want to have the most airtight evidence possible. And it's increasingly looking like you have that here in a way that penetrates that last shield that's always protected Donald Trump, which is that you don't always usually have that clear sign of personal involvement. That's still not quite what we have in the January 6th case, although we've gotten closer than we did in the Ukraine case or in other cases before. But this week we saw come forward in President Trump's own briefing, the assertion that he personally communicated with FBI agents when they came and visited Mar-a-Lago, talked to them, meaning when they said, hey, you have these documents we consider classified and a danger to national security for you to possess them and you need to give them back to us. And then he appears to have gone through, at least according to reporting in, I think, the Washington Post, said I, he personally went through the different boxes and looked at what's in them. Um, and then we know that they su subpoenaed video footage to say, well, this storage unit where this stuff is being stored in, we have video footage that, at least if it you know, provided response to the subpoena, should show who was accessing it and presumably, to some extent at least, what boxes may have been taken out of it. And we know some of those boxes were then found in Donald Trump's property in his personal residence where... Some of them had classified information in them. Like, that's a really, really damning case. And that's exactly the type of airtight evidence you are looking for if you're going to do something as politically challenging and as historical as prosecuting a former president. Uh, and especially because it's Merrick Garland, somebody who is so, so careful, I would be surprised if he'd settle for anything less. So I think this is the case that if charges go forward from the Justice Department against Donald Trump or anybody really close in his orbit, particularly against him, you know, I'm not sure they will, but if they do, I think it's going to be against these first before any of the other stuff we start talking about. And I think folks in the president's camp are beginning to realize just how much trouble they're in um, because 
the sorts of defensive measures and rhetoric we see coming out of them is, is just not encouraging. None of it is a sign of confidence, even the sorts of kind of bombastic confidence we saw in during the impeachments uh, and around January 6th. So, you know, I, I, I think there's real legal threat here. And this is really, of all these cases in terms of legal exposure for Donald Trump, this is the one that counts more than the others, frankly. Well, we will unfortunately have to leave the conversation there for now, but this would not be rational security if we did not leave you with some object lessons to ponder on until we are back in your ears next week. Alan, let me turn it over to you for your object lesson. So there are many wonderful things about Minnesota, but one of the wonderfulest, definitely top three, is our annual state fair, which is, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say, is the one true state fair in the United States. There are other good state fairs. I'm not denying that there are other good state fairs, but the Minnesota state fair is the best state fair. Have you ever been to the Iowa State Fair? Because the Iowa State Fair is kind of like the, you know, OG State Fair, isn't it? You know, look, I I, I think that Iowa is in, in many ways OG Upper Midwest, and in many ways Minnesota just took that and did it all better. So I'm I'm very comfortable saying that the Iowa may be the OG, but Minnesota is still the best. Uh, I am I am in a, a fun little Twitter war with uh, Iowa law professor Derek Muller over which is the best state fair, and I yield no inch of territory here. Um, but one of the best parts of the Minnesota, Minnesota State Fair is the uh, butter sculptures. Most importantly, the annual um, Princess K of the Milky Way uh, butter sculpture, where a, a, a individual is a uh, chosen to be Princess K in Minnesota, and then she gets her head sculpted out of a giant block of salted butter, uh, and that is displayed, and then they get to keep the salted butter. Even if, if you get to the state fair at the right time, you can actually watch the carving happen in real time. And today on the New York Times, on the front page, there is a profile of the new uh, Minnesota State Fair butter sculptor. Uh, and it's just a wonderful profile. Uh, it's great. And I also appreciate it because it is written in a totally non-mocking tone. The coastal elites of New York, of which I was one, uh, until I became a proud upper Midwesterner, have clearly recognized that this is just awesome, no sniggering necessary. And I think this is good repayment for the New York Times' infamous 2014 uh, grape salad takedown of Minnesota. I appreciate that uh, finally they have recognized the amazing cultural gifts of the proud upper Midwest. I just want to say that Alan's uh, zeal of the converted to Upper Midwestern <laughs> is it is almost religious in character. Um, it's the sort of fanaticism that only converts ever have. Exactly. Yeah, like, no zealot like convert. Yeah, exactly. Well, for my object lesson, since we are not with our usual co-host, Quinta Jurassic, I am taking over her traditional role of endorsing an article from The New Yorker. Yes, the New Yorker, because I read an interesting piece this past week, came out a little over a week ago now, actually, that I really enjoyed and is worth looking at despite the very annoying title. And that article is The Untold History of the Biden Family. It smacks of a sort of tabloid, annoying journalism that made me roll my eyes and avoid it for a little while. But I actually heard this really interesting interview with the author, Adam Entus. Really fantastic interview on the New Yorker podcast, I believe, that actually really delved into some of the author's takeaway, which mirrored my own. It is this fascinating story, which which the author, Adam, suggests probably President Biden himself doesn't even know, um, because it's the result of a lot of close investigation, genealogical records, dealing up public records about the background of President Biden's father and some of President Biden's father's cousins and uncle uh, and assorted relatives with whom he was involved in some very dodgy business enterprises um, that involved in a major fall from grace, involvement with some public corruption, uh, and some other items that led to the situation of being a very modest upbringing in Scranton and Wilmington that we all, are, I think, are a little more familiar with from President Biden's own description of his background and upraising, which the author doesn't really contest at all, that being fairly accurate. He is more providing the background of this father figure. And I think it was just such an interesting read. I think I mentioned on this podcast before, I spent a good part of the pandemic uh, before I extended my own family tree by having a kid, at which point I no longer have hobbies. Um, but before that, I spent a few months digging into my family's own uh, genealogy. And it's really interesting and really muddy story. Like people are just muddy and complicated and there are no true heroes and no true villains 100% of the way. And that's true even in one's own family. And digging into it, I found really fascinating and to shed a lot of light on 
a lot of things I knew about my family and gave it this new complexity that I found more human and approaching and endearing, even for some of my very flawed relatives uh, who I, I, I appreciate, but always didn't understand why they were certain ways the way they were. And, and I understood it better from my own family history. I feel that way about Joe Biden now in a way I actually find quite endearing from this piece, even though I'm sure this piece, like, frankly, is giving people in the White House heart attacks and our people are very nervous. It's going to you know, undermine people's election chances, things like that. I actually think it's super interesting and just paints like a very American story with all that means, good and bad, about the president's background that is just absolutely fascinating. Um, and so I highly, highly recommend folks check it out. Uh, it's just a great read. And maybe dig into some of your own family's histories because you will find as interesting stories there to the extent you can find them. But that is it for my object lesson. Ben, what do you have for us this week? On the first day of the January 6th committee hearings, I asked our two temporary associate editors for the summer, Matt Gluck and Tia Sewell, to follow the hearings and make a list of every single fact about Donald Trump's conduct that the hearing alleged or demonstrated. And uh, over the course of the eight, I think it was eight, uh, January 6th committee hearings, the three of us uh, composed, kept this running document of the evidence that the committee had amassed. And it kept growing. It's been on lawfare the whole time. It got big and unruly. And yesterday, we finished a lengthy project of editing it and narrowing it down to just the facts that the committee has introduced evidence on. Uh, it's down to about 55 pages now, and uh, we have divided it up. It's going to go up in nine lawfare posts, each devoted to a particular thematic set of material that the committee sought to prove. The, in, in the opening hearing, Vice Chair Cheney identified seven points that made up in her judgment the conspiracy by the president to continue to hold office. And we've divided this material up into materials in support of those seven points. I think it is the most uh, comprehensive summary of the committee's evidence that has ever been published, other than by the committee itself in presenting the hearings. It takes much less time to read than the hearings do to watch or listen to. Uh, and so I commend it to you if you want a single document neatly organized that gives, including with links to all the testimonies, uh, all the evidence presented by the January 6th committee. Uh, Matt Gluck and Tia Sewell and I have you covered. I think it will be up by the time this episode of Rational Security goes live, although you may have to wait a day uh, as we're still ironing out a few of the kinks. Nicely done. This sounds epic. Epic. We live. <laughs> but what will you do without Matt and Tia when, when the January 6th commission comes back in the fall? That's the real question. Look yeah, at so future interns and research associates. It's a big problem because uh, Matt and Tia are both uh, finishing up their tenure here. And so um, we are devastated by that. Uh, as Trump would say, we love them. They are very special. <laughs> Well, that officially brings us to the end of this week's episode. <laughs> Rational Security 2.0 is like it's for a production of Lawfare. Follow us on Twitter at RATL Security and be sure to leave a rating or review wherever you might be listening. While you're at it, visit lawfareblog.com for our show page with links and past episodes for our written work and the written work of other Lawfare contributors and for information on Lawfare's other podcast series. And be sure to sign up to become a material supporter of Lawfare on Patreon for an ad-free version of this podcast and other special benefits. Wait, 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 Scott, say that part again. Be sure to what? Sign up to become a material supporter of Lawfare on Patreon. Say it one more time. Material supporter of Lawfare on there Patreon. There you go. Where can you do it? Oh, at patreon.com slash lawfare. Good. You can go on now. What the hell just happened? No, I was just getting getting Scott to say this over and over again. All right, I'll do it. <laughs> 
for an ad-free version. Now I'm afraid to talk anymore. My childhood speech impediment drama is coming back to me in deep, deep ways. Nope, nope, nope. I was just trying to emphasize the sign up to become a material supporter. Fair. It was nothing about your speech. Fair. Okay. Good to know. Good to know. For an ad-free version of this podcast and other special benefits. That's what you get if you sign up to become a material <laughs> supporter of Lawfare on Patreon at patreon.com slash lawfare. Our audio engineer and producer this week was Jay Venables of Go Rodeo, and our music, as always, was performed by Sophia Yan, and we are once again edited by the ever, ever, ever generous and patient Jen Pachow. On behalf of my co-host, Alan, and our special guest, Benjamin Wittes, I am Scott R. Anderson, and we will talk to you next week. Until then, goodbye, bros.